there are so many uh, there are so many profound characters in the Bible, so many character lessons that can be derived from their experiences with God, uh, so many so many characters worthy of not just admiration but emulation. You know, people that are your spiritual heroes, you look back and say, "I would love to have the the faith of Abraham or the the courage of Paul." Uh, power of Elijah, whatever it may be, but of all the characters that I can think of in the Bible, the one that is the most compelling character and the most convicting character, of course, apart from Jesus himself, the most compelling and convicting one for me is John the Baptist. What's interesting about John the Baptist is this, as I look at John the Baptist and the way that he approached his relationship with God, um, the way that he engaged the culture around him, the way that he lived, Here's a question that drives me. Is I'm, I'm looking at John the Baptist, and, and you know, I'm looking at, you know, he lived off the land, the, the locusts and wild honey, not bugs probably, but little bananas, but you know, living off the land. He's, he's wearing this camel skin coat. He does not care what people think about him. Um, his message is bold, and it's clear, and it's sharp, and it hits the culture he lives in right square between the eyes. Um, John the Baptist, I, and I look at his life and just how it... He wasn't shaped by the people. He was totally shaped by the mission God had given him. He was 100% in, no reservations, no holding back, no regrets. And I wonder, what if John the Baptist and his relationship with God, what if that is normal? I mean, what if that is normal? What if that is what God has been expecting all this time? And what if anything less than that, anything short of that is not normal, it's subpar, abnormal? I mean, what if normal Christianity, normal Christ following doesn't look like what we do today in our comfort and our ease and our just adding a little bit of Jesus culture around us, but what if it looks like this full-scale, sold-out, I don't care anymore what anyone thinks of me or what this world does to me, I'm going to follow Jesus and do exactly what he says. What if that's normal? Because I look at John the Baptist's life, and and I tell you honestly, I say, that's not like me. I'm not that bold. I'm not that outspoken. I'm not that, I'm not that sharp of a stick. I'm not that pointed of an edge. I'm not that fearless. I'm not that reckless. I'm not that cross, uh, that anti-cultural, that, that person at odds with the place I live. No, I, I like too much in this world, and I want too much of this world. And, and there's a big part of me, like there's probably a part of many or most or all of you that wants to be liked by this world. And John the Baptist was none of those things. I say, wow, what if this is the way it's supposed to be? I want you to be thinking about John the Baptist. I want you to be challenged by him. Don't look at him as some sort of aberration, some sort of blip on the spiritual radar of biblical stories. But what, what if this is, what if this is, the type of follower that God really expects? What if this sort of radical approach to life and faith and Christ himself is normal? John says something profound that we're going to explore here for a few moments in John chapter 3. In verse 30, John says this, He must increase. I must decrease. He must increase. I must decrease. You, you could do a lot worse for yourself for a life motto than that. You, you could do a lot worse for yourself than a verse that will mark how you approach everything than that. Less of me, more of him. People knowing and seeing and recognizing and applauding and approving of and liking me and more of promoting and proclaiming And finding my joy in the discovery of Him. He must increase. I must decrease. If you think about that for a moment, that's that's pretty countercultural. That's pretty anti-conventional thinking. In fact, our whole culture today seems to be bent on raising our own self-esteem, raising our sense of what we can accomplish, Finding the greatness within us. I was doing a Google search on John the Baptist and I found a sermon by a bishop so-and-so, I won't give you the name. And he turned the story of John the Baptist to this, finding the champion in you. What? Or, 
John the Baptist's life story would be this, finding the champion, and his name is Jesus, it's not me. If you find me, you found nothing. I must decrease, he must increase. What if we bent our lives towards that direction? The magnification, the exaltation, the making much of Jesus in everything. My suggestion is this. You'll not find great payoff for that in this life. You'll not find great financial reward or personal reward. You'll not find a great number of accolades for that or praise for that in this life. But I've got this more than sneaking suspicion that if we would bend our life's purpose towards making much of Jesus, we would find it to be eminently worth it for all eternity. That's what I believe. Would you pray with me this morning as we look at this passage together today? Father, here's what I believe. Here's what I've come to see and know. Uh, The words that I speak have no power apart from you. Your Scripture... Your word that you've given us has power contained in it. It does penetrate. It does separate. It gets to the very heart and core of us, to the joints and marrow of the bones. Father, that's true. Father, also see in the teachings of Jesus and throughout the New Testament our total dependence upon your Spirit. If your Spirit does not blow through like the wind, bending and moving us, then we stay unmoved, we stay unresponsive. Father, if someone is sitting here today and doesn't really hear, doesn't really see the truth in these words, doesn't really hear from your Spirit, doesn't see what you're revealing and hear what you're saying and do what you're commanding, they would not be the first to do that. In fact, they would join the multitudes that have done that throughout the centuries. That crowd is large and lost. Father, I pray you would speak today so that we would hear. And Father, that you would reveal so we would see. And Father, that uh, your Holy Spirit would do a work that takes some hearts that are hard and callous or cold or indifferent or disinterested, in love with this world, whatever it may be, and capture them so we see you. We see what is best for everything you do so clearly. Is that a love for us? It's love. It's love that drives all of this. That you love us and want something different and better for us. It's love that drives this. Satan confuses that. May there be no confusion today about your good purposes and the good news of the gospel. Speak to us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's the context. Open your Bible. We're going to go through some of these passages quickly. John chapter 3, verse 22. Here's the setting that brings about this encounter and the statement of John the Baptist. And there's some lessons we're going to learn about this kind of sold-out life. John 3.22 says, After this, Jesus and and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Enon near Salim because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put into prison. Now discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. Well, what's, what's he talking about here? Okay, you've you got, you got a group here of followers. Now the, the term rabbi in this day and age was still so broad and so, uh, I guess you could say non-technical, Okay, this wasn't like a technical title born out of a certain amount of training, uh, a religious uh, formalized training, because John taught and he had people that followed him that made him a rabbi. So his people are coming to him, and what they're realizing is now John's influence in terms of drawing big crowds and people being amazed at his powerful teaching and people coming and being baptized, John's influence seems to be waning because there's someone on the other side of the river whose influence is increasing. And because they're still in the formative stages of their faith, Um, John's disciples don't quite understand this, though John had endorsed, clearly proclaimed, this is he, Jesus, this is the one, this is the one that's coming to save us from our sins, this is the hope of the world, this is the light coming to darkness, this is the Lamb of God, right? John said that. They're still trying to figure it out, and really his disciples, they don't want their guy to lose his spot, they don't want him to lose his influence, his place, and so there's a little bit of, you know, there's a little bit of competition developing here. There's some thoughts I want to share with you that are not the most Important thoughts of this passage, but important enough for us to visit just for a moment on the theme of baptism. 
If you're an underliner or a note taker, notice what is it that calls John to baptize in this place? This is not a technical question. It's not a theological question. This is a practical question. Well, why did John baptize where he baptized? He says it right there. Because there was enough water. Now listen, I'm not trying to make a deep theological point here, but whenever there was a baptism in the Bible, every single one of them took place in the same way. It was a baptism by immersion. That's why he had to make sure there was enough water. The very word itself means to put under the water. And so he's looking for a place where there's simply enough water to do it. He's baptizing people with water. But there's something more significant here even than the process of baptism. It's the purpose. See, John was baptizing, and his baptism was a sort of ritual purification. In Hebrew, that would be a mikvah. It's like a purification bath. In fact, there were some more extreme, more radical sects of Judaism that performed a mikvah daily, sometimes multiple times per day. Some have thought that maybe John the Baptist was an Essene, like the community at Qumran where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. A radical uh, uh, group of Jews looking forward to the imminent coming of the Messiah. They were waiting every day. And part of the process was they were baptized every morning. And that baptism was for purification, repentance of sins, and in anticipation of the Messiah coming. So in other words, we're getting baptized. Our sins are washed away, or a declaration that our sins are being washed away, and readiness so that the Messiah might come. So when you see John's baptism, it's a purification baptism. He's not saying get baptized and that washes away your sins. He's saying if you have repented of your sins, demonstrate it by baptism. But Jesus' baptism is significantly different than what John would do. In fact, John even declares this when he talks about the differences between him and Jesus. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and with fire. We see this promise come to fruition in Acts chapter 1. We see the words of Jesus in verse 4 of Acts 1. While staying there with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of of the Father, which, he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, that was symbolic of the repentance you've just done, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. What's the difference between the two? One symbolized the acts of my own righteousness. I'm trying to do better here. I've turned. I I need to be baptized today. And so they were doing it over and over and over. As often as repentance was necessary, so was the baptism. Imagine if you had to be baptized every single time you sinned and repented of it. Some of you would be awfully soggy. You'd be pruned from the baptisms. Jesus comes and says, no, I'm doing something different. I'm not recognizing your self-efforts at righteousness. What I'm doing is I'm giving you the one key that will make you righteous. I'm baptizing you with the fire of my Holy Spirit because when the Holy Spirit is given to someone, when the Holy Spirit fills someone, this is not an if, maybe, perhaps they're going to change. They change. You do understand that, by the way. Again, there's lots of little sermonettes in this context here. If the Holy Spirit is in you, change is not optional. Change happens. The Holy Spirit is a divine change agent. It is the power of God that affects us. It always affects. Not that it might change, but that it does change. And Jesus is saying, when I will give you my baptism, it will be a baptism of fire and spirit, and that's what I do. So Jesus is offering some things that, of course, John cannot. Jesus is offering redemption, final redemption. Jesus is offering sanctification. You're going to be changed. You're going to become like me. Jesus is offering the full assurance of our faith and our salvation. It's a bit different. But here's what John says to all this. So his disciples come to him and says, John, you realize, you know, our church is getting smaller, his is getting bigger. Not exactly, but that's a similar sort of thinking. Our tribe is decreasing, his is increasing. What do you think about that, John? You need to step up your game. You know, maybe you need to figure out how you're going to preach a little bit better. Uh, maybe you need to introduce some, um, you know, something more artistic or something more creative. Or, you know, I, you got to come up with something. Maybe a band, maybe some lights, some smoke. I don't know. Maybe a contemporary service, John. You got to do something different. And here's what John says. A person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. 
He bears witness to what he's seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. There are a lot of deep, profound, short sermons in the Bible, none more profound than that one. John's declaration of Jesus. And in this, John is saying who he is, who Jesus is, what Jesus has done for us, and how we ought to respond to that. And why John's life looks like it did. Why John did what he did. Why John lived like he lives is all summarized, all in that statement of that declaration of faith. So from this, I want to draw out to you, for you today, four elements from John's declaration and John's life, four elements of a life that's genuinely on mission. And when I say on mission, I'm on the assignment of God. I know who my commander is. I know what his commands are. And I'm bent on fulfilling them no matter what. What does that look like? Number one, John demonstrates here his recognition that God is supreme in all things. The supremacy of God in all things is the, is the driving factor of John's life. That God is supreme. Look at that, that statement. Um, you know, he says at the beginning, you cannot receive even one thing unless God has given it to you. When, when, you're, when you're having your quiet time, when you're having your personal prayer time, does that reality ever settle in on you? You ever sit there and, and read that one verse and just stop there for a while and ponder that for a minute? You, you would not have even one thing were it not from God? You say, no, no, I work for this. No, you would not have even one thing? But if someone else gave me this, no, this, you know, whatever your answers are, one, you would not have one thing. God is supreme over all. If He is the one who is the source of everything that you are, if John reiterates again and again, He is above all things. He's the one that's from heaven. Everything is under Him. Everything is about Him. Do you kind of see where I'm going with this? Doesn't it make sense if the one who is supreme in every way, the giver of everything, the one who's over everything, the one who's at the beginning of it, and the one who is going to hold us account at the end of it, doesn't it make sense then in the biggest picture way to say, God, I must be living my life for the supreme thing? What's bigger than that? What's more important than that? And so when you're, when you're facing that sort of pressure, like when John knew that to say, speak against Herod Antipas, that was the son of Herod the Great. Called the Great because he built a lot of great stuff, not because he was a great person, he was a heinous person. But when he spoke truth to power to Herod Antipas, stealing your brother-in-law's wife is a violation of every command of God, violation of everything that makes a, a person set apart unto God, a violation of every code of moral belief here. This is wrong. When he did that, he didn't care about the cost. How do you do that sort of thing? How do you say something that you know is going to cost you maybe even your life? How do you do that? How do you speak with such boldness to people's beliefs when you know they're going to be angry at the confrontation? How do you stand up and say things people aren't ready to hear and do things no one else is willing to do and live in a way that's totally contrary to the way everybody else is living? How do you do that without having a sense? I'm doing this for the one who is supreme over everything. You live for so many smaller things. I'm living for this big thing. And that's what he did. Number two, John had a pretty keen sense and a humble acceptance of his divine assignment. He accepted what God had given him to do. I know who I am. I know this time and space that I am, when I am, is by God's design. John may not be as well studied by you, I don't know, maybe not as well known or Perhaps not even as highly regarded as some of the great Old Testament prophets like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Elijah. But he was the greatest of them. He was the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. You say, wait, 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 we're in the New Testament, right? No, no, he was the last one preparing the way. The last one declaring the message. The last one of an era before Christ and before the crucifixion and resurrection and ascension of Jesus. He's the last one, the last messenger. That's not by mistake. God chose John for a critical period, the most critical time. In the fullness of time, God sent his son. And what was that baby dancing in the womb when that son was coming? It was, it was John. 
I was only six months older than Jesus. And he accepted that. And the where I am right here and right now, I'm not the Christ, he said, but I have been sent before him. Here's what I think. I think the majority of Christians today have no sense of divine assignment. So we flounder. Spiritually, that is. And when we take our assignments from someone else, we'll take our assignments, our cues from the world or from our family or whatever it may be, expectations that others might set. Hey, this is what your life is for. This is what's worth living for. But how many of us can honestly say, I've got a sense of divine assignment. I know who I am. I know why God put me, where he placed me. I know that this timing is not by accident. I want to be like David, of whom Scripture said in a sort of spiritual epitaph, David fulfilled God's purpose in his generation, and then he died. That's pretty good tombstone material right there, right? Fill in your name. Fulfilled God's purpose in his generation, and then he died. That's good enough. Do you have a sense of divine assignment? I'm not sure I would rest until I had that. If I were you, I'm not sure I would rest if I had a a keen sense of God. What is it you've sent me right here, right now? The who, the when, the where of of me, God, in relationship to you. John had it. You know, that gives your life incredible focus and power. That gives you the ability to say no to so many other things that would conflict with that or distract from that. When you know the one thing, it helps you say no to so many other potentially good things but lesser things. And he had it. He had a sense of divine assignment. Number three. This one I struggled a little bit and as I was making my notes, I kept changing this. Again, how do I say this in a way that carries the right sort of power that really should be here in this? And how do I get this message across clearly? And I hope you'll get a sense of this from the Scriptures. I'm hoping that uh, and praying that God's Spirit will fill in the gaps of what I can't communicate clearly enough. John had a, a tremendous delight Okay, his, his sense of joy, I mean, what really lit the, the fuse of John, what, what really got John going was the exaltation of Christ. I mean, that, that was where his, his greatest joy was. There's a metaphor here of the bridegroom. See, John is saying, in essence, listen, I'm Jesus' best man. I'm Jesus' best man. I'm not here in competition for the bride of Christ. All these people that were calling to repent, all these people that I've been telling, prepare the way because the Lord is coming. All these people that I've been saying, your Messiah is here. There he is. This is the Lamb of God. I feel like I'm the best man at a wedding. And when I see my, my best friend, when I see the joy in his face at the uniting of, of his life with his bride, and I, and I see the joy of this bride receiving her husband, he said, man, that, that's, what, that's what gets me going. That was John. John's greatest pleasure in this life was to see people see Christ. I mean, a life on mission. I mean, there are a lot of things that that we can draw pleasure from, for sure. There are a lot of things that we enjoy. Uh, There are a lot of things that we have fun at and hobbies that we do and things like that. But for a person whose life is on mission, there's something that would trump all of that. If I can see people finally see who God really is and understand the gospel and embrace that, Man, what, what's better than, and that was John, the making much of Christ was his joy. The more Jesus increased, the greater John's joy increased. The more Jesus was made much of, the more John's heart was lifted. His, his joy, his, his delight was in the making much of Christ, the exaltation of Christ. Now that's a life on mission. I mean, you may do a certain job and do it with passion. You may have you know, certain sports that you play and you give it all you got. You may have certain hobbies that you're trying to do really good at and you, and you pursue and you want to do well. But when your life is on God's assignment and you have a sense of God as supreme above all things, and you want, therefore, nothing more than for other people to see the supremacy of Christ in all things, then that joy of relationship, that moment when eyes of bride meet eyes of groom coming down that aisle, and this relationship is beginning. There's nothing bigger than that. And that's what John is saying. is Christ. I'll tell you a fourth thing. A fourth thing that marks more of what John did and what John experienced perhaps than what John said. But John very clearly had a willingness to be rejected. Or worse. If you're going to be on mission for Christ, if you're going to live a life out of a sense of divine assignment and purpose, You have to understand that that absolutely goes along with 
rejection. And this is not just a, a modern cultural phenomenon. This has been true for 2,000 years. Jesus said this over and over. You know, Jesus says that to his disciples, he says, as the world has hated me, they're going to hate you. They're, they're, this world is going to hate you. He tells his early, his early followers what to do when you're kicked out of town, or what to do when the door is slammed in your face, what to do when you're arrested. You know, well, what, what do you do in those moments? You trust in me. I'll give you the words to speak. Shake the dust off your feet and move on, but this is going to happen. He even tells him, he says, you know, offenses are going to come. You're going to have your feelings hurt. You're going to have your reputation attacked. You're going to have your toes stepped on. You're going to have your intentions maligned. I mean, John the Baptist himself, you know what they said about John the Baptist? Jesus said, Jesus said, John the Baptist went about neither eating nor drinking. He wasn't really the social type, if you understand what I'm saying. He wasn't like the type just to hang out. He went about neither eating nor drinking, and the people said of him, he's demon-possessed. John the Baptist was so different than the culture he lived in that people said, there's something deeply wrong with him. I guess saying he's demon-possessed would be sort of the first century equivalent of saying, that guy's playing out nuts. He's crazy. No one wants to be that radical. Man, the church today, when I say the church, I don't mean church services or church buildings or church programs. I mean the church, the people of church today, we seem so bent on getting embraced by this modern culture of cool that people would like us, that people would accept us, that, that you know, the people would, this world would embrace us. John cared none about any of that stuff. He just wanted that this world would hear him and see Christ. And he was willing to be rejected, really, or worse than that. Simple question. And I'll trust the Holy Spirit to drive it home for you. In your relationship with God, in your life on mission, are you willing to be rejected by people? Are you willing to not be invited to the party? Are you willing not to be befriended? Are you willing not to be liked? Are you willing to be offensive? Are you willing to be hated for that? Are you willing to be rejected? Because if you're not willing to face rejection, you cannot, cannot, you cannot be an agent of the gospel. You can't. Because if you talk about Jesus clearly, there's going to be this offense. The Bible says it. There's going to be an offense. It is, as Scripture calls, the offense of the cross. What is the offense of the cross? What is the offense of this table? What is the offense of these hymns that we have sung today? What is the offense of the message of John or the message of Jesus? What is that offense? You and your sin separate you from God. And guilt is not simply a feeling, it's a condition, and it's real. And there's a holy judge who holds us accountable for sin. And the only remedy for sin, and what shows you the totality of sin, and the grotesqueness of sin, is the cross. And unless you deal with your sin, you will die in your sin. And that death will cause you to be forever separated from God. And not just separated in some nebulous sort of darkness. Not where you're just hanging out with Ozzy and your friends from the, from the old days, um, down in a place called hell in some sort of smoky bar band but conscious everlasting torment as a reminder of the holiness of God and the seriousness of sin. And yet God offers you a cross where Jesus died for those sins. And you've got to get over yourself to embrace the goodness of Jesus who loves you who's on the other side. Who's saying, come to me. Come to me, you who labor, you who work, you who are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. You've got to be willing to be rejected to tell that message. I give you this as a conclusion. It's sort of a simple thing for you to think about and maybe discuss with others as you leave here. Who or what are you willing to expend your life for? I mean, I'm saying things that are obvious. You're going to die. It's a point unto all men wants to die after this judgment. Um, some of you are flickering and going to flicker out very slowly and inconsequentially. Some may flame out magnificently. John did. John burned out magnificently. In fact, Jesus said that of him. John 5.35, a passage we'll get to in a couple of weeks. Jesus said of John, he was a burning and shining lamp. He was a burning and shining lamp. I mean, here's a man who'd barely, who had barely reached his 30s. I mean, who, whose ministry was so small, so, so brief, but so powerful. Whose influence is so deep, so lasting. 
He was a burning and shining lamp, Jesus says, but that light was extinguished, at least in our eyes, at least from our perspective, far too soon. Far too soon. Matthew chapter 14 tells us what happened to to John. It says, when Herod's birthday came, that's Herod Antipas, son of Herod the Great. So when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. You know, we're just assuming, reading between the lines, this drunken, debaucherous party and this daughter of his wife that he'd stolen from his brother-in-law is dancing in front of him, and Herod gets so worked up over the whole deal, he makes a really stupid promise. I'll give you whatever you want. Maybe he thought she was going to ask for something, you know, financial, uh, tangible, um, you know. Who who knows? Made an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, the one who hated John, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And then the king was sorry. Maybe he sobered up very quickly. But because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it be given. He's kind of put himself in a spot now. He's the king. The king won't do what he says. The king won't keep his oath. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl. And she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it. And they went and told Jesus. Just like that, it's over. A light burning brightly, burning and shining. And yet Jesus would say about this brief nova of a person, this supernova of of a prophet, Jesus would say about him in Matthew 11, verse 11, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Think about that just for a moment. Ministry was brief. Barely 30 years old, and he's he's gone. Tragically, in a flash. And Jesus says, I tell you, there's no one that's ever been born. And for emphasis, truly, I tell you, there's nobody. This is the this is the best mankind has ever produced, it's John the Baptist. And so I ask you this question: what are you going to burn your life out for? What are you willing to give your life for? Perhaps some of you have heard of Peter Marshall, not the old game show host. Peter Marshall, former chaplain of the U.S. Senate. Peter Marshall was born in Scotland in 1902, came to the U.S. in 1927 at age 24. Within 10 years, he graduated seminary and became pastor of a very large church in Washington, D.C., um, New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. Delivered many famous sermons to sitting presidents, senators, and our nation's leaders throughout the period before and during World War II. In 1946, when the war was over, Marshall was appointed as U.S. Senate chaplain where he carried on that role of being an advisor to our nation's leaders and our nation's presidents, decision makers. In 1949, Peter Marshall experienced a sudden heart attack that took his life at age 46. The 46 years that Marshall spent on earth, the 22 years he spent in America, are not so much known for the sum of their days, but for the amount of their influence. Perhaps you've heard of his wife, Catherine Marshall. She went on to author some 200 books Almost all of them derived from Peter's sermons. Countless other books have been written about Marshall or have been influenced by Marshall's leadership and influence and Christian witness. A Man Called Peter, one of her books, has turned into a feature film that was Oscar nominated. Why do I tell you this? Before his death, Peter Marshall was quoted as saying this in one of his most famous statements. The measure of life is not its duration, but its donation. Not its duration, but its donation. And gone at 46. That's fairly sobering for a guy who's standing here in front of you who's 47. Listen, your life is going to end. You're going to give it for something. You're going to spend it in some way. Now look at John the Baptist who's decided, whatever window of time I've got, brief or large, whatever place God puts me, whatever audience He gives me, Whatever influence I have over whoever he places in my life, it is going to be for the sake of Christ. I'm going to make much of him. I'm going to make much of Jesus. And I'm going to cast my lots with Christ. I'm going to build my life on that. What he thinks, what he rewards, on the one who's supreme over everything. What about you? What are you going to spend yours on? Would you pray with me this morning?
Father, I, I just pray that those words that John spoke would resound in our ears past today. Speaking of Jesus, our Savior, that He must increase and we must decrease. That was more than just about groups of followers. That was more than just about popularity of preaching. That was more than just about frequency of baptisms. That was about life. Father, I pray that you would stir us. I, I just I entrust um, your word and its contents and its purposes, Father, in the hands of your spirit right now for the sake of the people who've been listening. And Father, somehow in some way, I pray you would use um, my feeble words in this for your glory, for your purposes. But God, that you might stir some people up today to say, what am I living for? Do I want to go out like this? Do I want to go out just to just slowly flickering away? Do I want to burn out brightly for the sake of Christ? Fathers, I said at the beginning, I can't imagine. I can't imagine regretting being a bright and shining lamp for you. I can't imagine regretting that for all eternity. But Father, I can easily imagine regretting burning our lives up for so many lesser causes. I can imagine regretting that for all eternity. Father, have your way in us. Do what you will in us. Speak to our hearts today. Listen, as you pray, in just a moment, we're going to start a song together. I just want to ask you, if you just bow your heads, remain in that state just for a moment so I can speak to you. And You know, the premise of this message is pretty simple. You're living. I'm challenging you to live for something, but not just something good, something big. I'm not challenging you to just find your thing and go for it. What I'm challenging you to do is find the thing and live for that. I'm challenging you actually to respond to the one who is found, who is seeking you that he might find you and live for him. That's what I'm challenging you to do. I'm challenging you to see, see Jesus as John did. You're it. You're the beginning and the end. You're above all things. I would not have a thing without you. Will you come to that spot today and say you're worth it? You're worth my devotion. You're worth my affection. You're worth my life. You're worth that. Now, if that's real to you, that's going to change some things. I, I know it. It can't help but. And Jesus was no add-on to John's life. Okay? He was no accessory to John's life. It wasn't John doing my thing and Jesus, you fulfill me. Help me do it better. It, it, it wasn't, I'm going to live how I please and I'm going to blend in with this world, but just in case there's a heaven, Jesus, come into my heart because you know, when I die, I want to make sure I don't die and end up in the wrong place just in case it's real. And there was certainly none of this, well, let's not get too radical, let's not get too carried away with this. I don't want to be extreme. I mean, I don't want people to think I'm demon-possessed or anything, like I'm, I'm crazy. There was none of that. There was a blatant disregard for the cultural norms all around him. There was a shrugging off of the restraints of this world. There was a, there was a divine, Jesus-centered, I'm going to live for you, no strings attached, nothing held in reserve. And he did. And Jesus recognized it. He was a bright and shining flame. And there was never a man like him. What do you want to live for? What do you want to give your life for? What are you going to do?